the Dynamic Duel podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. And in just two weeks, we will be reviewing Birds of Prey, the first major feature film from Marvel and DC of 2020. Right, and leading up to that film, we have a series of Birds of Prey related episodes to get to, this being one of them. We're going to talk about who would win in a fight between Batgirl, Barbara Gordon, who's a founding member of Birds of Prey, even though she's not in the movie. Right, right. It's a travesty. Yeah. But we're going to find out if she can beat Hawkeye, Kate Bishop. And she, of course, is the original Hawkeye's protege, who kind of took over his mantle when he died in the comics. Right, during the disassembled event. She's a member of the Young Avengers, and she's going to be appearing in the upcoming Hawkeye television show that's coming out on Disney+. Plus. Not this year, but next year. They're hoping to cast Haley Steinfeld in Kate Bishop's role, but we'll see if that pans out. And you'll get to learn all about her later on in this episode when we get into the characters' backstories and abilities and then improvise a battle scenario between the two characters. Right, and then run math on their stats to find out who would actually win. Before we get into that, we're going to break down the comic book movie news from the past week. There are a few items, including the announcement that Bad Robot will be developing Justice League dark film and television projects for Warner Brothers. Right, and Bad Robot is a production studio run by J.J. Abrams. Right. We're also going to be talking about how the Captain Marvel sequel lost its directors, Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck. I'm not too heartbroken about that news, but we'll talk about it. As always, our segment times are in our episode description, so feel free to jump around the episode to whatever section you want to listen to. Please don't forget to share, subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on whatever platform you happen to be listening to us on. It goes a long way in helping us promote the show. Yeah, and it doesn't take much work to do. We put a lot of work in the podcast, and it just takes a few seconds to click that five-star button, or whatever star rating you prefer. But now that that's done, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out up until the 90s to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Dual No Prize, is a digital award we post on social media. Jonathan draws for those who we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week's question was, how would you bring back Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow into the MCU after her death in Endgame? Yeah, this was an interesting question, so I was really looking forward to the answers that you guys gave. And there were actually so many great theories out there, so many different awesome ways to bring her back. Yeah, there were a lot more different approaches to this than I thought there were. Yeah, let's get into the answers. Our first honorable mention goes to Harrison Fox, who said that Black Widow could be a Scarlet Witch magic projection in much the same way she changed reality in the House of M event in the comics. And actually, that's how she restored like Hawkeye back to life. But he wasn't a projection. He actually came back to life, right? Right, right. But Scarlet Witch has the reality warping abilities to do that. And we know that she will be changing reality in the upcoming WandaVision show on Disney+. Plus. Right. But Winter said that he would like to see 100 Black Widow spiders, like, burst from her cadaver that would take over the world. I mean, I don't know if that really answers the question. I don't it's think so. It's kind of like a nightmare scenario. <laughs> that's, like, that's like Marvel Zombies or yeah, something weird like that. Yeah, it would be like an alternate that. universe where that happens. Neil Poling from Twitter said that Black Widow should not be brought back into the MCU and that it's time for new characters and stories. And that's actually probably my personal favorite answer because, yeah, like let her death mean something and kind of like move on from that. I mean, it meant something for the time. I like all my favorite characters to be alive, okay? And in one room at the same time, just having a party and fighting crime afterwards. That's what I want. It's too much. Too many characters. (laughs) Red Hood and Aaron Alexander Jones said that Black Widow could always come back as a multiverse copy. From an alternate dimension? Right. Yeah. Tim Brown gave a similar answer, but said that both Black Widow and Quicksilver could come back via an alternate timeline. And considering the fact that they delved into time travel in Endgame, that could work. That's how Gamora came back. Right, exactly. Richard McGrew said that Black Widow could come back as a Hydra clone, like they would have her DNA. Or maybe not even Hydra, maybe the Red Room, the Black Widow program, could have her DNA or something and bring her back as a clone. Yeah, that's a good answer. Matt Estes said that maybe the Black Widow that sacrificed herself was a Skrull. And that would be kind of cool. It would set up the secret invasion pretty damn well. Yeah. If Marvel decided to go that route. Chance Martinez said that Black Widow's body could be injected with an alien serum, and then her memories would be altered a la Phil Coulson in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. television show. Except in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the Kree serum that was used to bring Phil Coulson back from the dead, the last of it was, I think, given to Quake in that show. So I don't think there's any more left. 
That being said, make more. They could just, you know, go into space, go to the Cree, kill a Cree guy, get his blood, make more. Dang. George Kronitis said that Florence Pugh's character in the upcoming Black Widow movie, Yelena Belova, could take over the Black Widow mantle. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that doesn't really answer the question either, because we were looking specifically to bring back Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow. That being said, I would totally be okay with Yelena Belova as a legacy character. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy Orr also said that he didn't want to see Black Widow return, but if she had to, it would probably be a multiverse version of her, or her sister Yelena Belova would take up the Black Widow mantle. Before we announce the winner, I kind of want to give myself an honorable mention here. You don't get to. I think the way they could bring back Black Widow would be if they were to introduce in her film a concept that's kind of like the Mission Impossible face swapping, or like from Face Off, Uh where Yelena Belova took... Scarlett Johansson's face, and she was really the one who got the blonde hair and died in the Avengers films. Does that still work within the rules of the Soul Stone? I guess if Hawkeye thought that the person who died was somebody that he loved, maybe it still counts. Yeah, yeah, there's justification right there. But the winners of this week's No Prize, there are actually three of them, they all gave the same answer, are John Spees, Colby Hentges, and Ken Johnson, who all said that Adam Warlock could bring Black Widow back with the Soul Stone. Even though the Soul Stone was destroyed by Thanos within the present endgame timeline, if they found a way to bring it back, or construct a new one perhaps, I think this is a fantastic way to bring back those characters. Because I'm imagining that in the Guardians of the Galaxy 3 film, maybe that version of Gamora just never clicks with Peter Quill. And distraught, he goes out to try to find a way to bring back the old Gamora. In the process, running into Adam Warlock, who was set up in the previous Guardians of the Galaxy film, and that whole movie is just about Quill trying to find his love again. They bring the original Gamora back, and in the process, also bring back Black Widow, who is also in the Soul Realm. But what do you do with the current Gamora, then? I mean, who cares, right? She could go off and do her own thing. Doesn't matter. Okay, all right. Congrats once again to John Spees, Colby Henches, and Ken Johnson. You guys win this week's No Prize. If you, the listener, want to win your own no prize, stay tuned till later on in this episode when we'll ask another question of the week. With that out of the way, on to the news. Okay, so I think back in late 2019, we first learned that J.J. Abrams' production company, Bad Robot, had made a deal with Warner Media to develop some content for HBO Max and their film division. We didn't know if it was DC or not, so we didn't actually talk about it on this podcast, but now it's been confirmed, I think Deadline was the first one to confirm it last week, that Bad Robot will be developing Justice League Dark projects for both film and TV. That's pretty cool. I wonder why Justice League Dark specifically. Yeah, I think Warner Brothers has been trying to get Justice League Dark off the ground for quite a while now. Yeah. How long ago was it that Guillermo del Toro first wrote that Dark Universe script? Right. It's almost been like five years now, I think. Yeah, and then Doug Liman was attached to direct. That's right. And then it kind of went nowhere. It kind of fizzled out. Yeah. But it is a hot property to adapt for HBO Max and DC Films. And I think it's the characters. Like, the characters involved are pretty popular. Yeah, we're talking about Constantine, Swamp Thing, Dead Man, Zatanna, Etrigan, among others. I mean, right now in the comics, Wonder Woman is leading the Justice League Dark team. Oh, really? Yeah, so I I think there's a number of tie-ins you could have to current, like, Warner Brother properties right now. Yeah. I mean, they already did have a Swamp Thing series. I wonder if Bad Robot will just branch off of that James Wan-produced series. Well, it seems like J.J. Abrams, like, works pretty well with other creators. You know, how many times have you seen TV shows that, you know, he's partnered with Jonathan Nolan or Damon Lindelof or, you know, all these other creative people. Yeah. I think him and James Wan could totally bring back the Swamp Thing television show that really didn't deserve to be canceled in the first place. Yeah, it was an accounting error that got it canceled, right? Yeah, yeah, it was stupid. But there are a lot of horror fans out there, and I think this is the perfect way to bridge that horror movie, superhero movie gap. It opens an entire world up for fans of both genres. Yeah, and I think certain characters like Constantine kind of lend themselves really well to horror, but there's also other characters like Detective Chimp, who's a member of the Justice League Dark, who, you know, you can have a little bit more fun with. Yeah, yeah. I wish Marvel would do something like this. I'd like to see them delve into, like, almost this horror universe. I mean, they were thinking about doing it under Jeff Loeb's Marvel television division. Yeah, a brand called Spirits of Vengeance. Yeah, Hellstrom and Ghost Rider. Yeah, but those projects are now no longer in development. 
Now, there's no word yet as to, like, which specific characters will get their own TV show and which ones will get films. And even if they get films, there's no word saying that J.J. Abrams specifically will direct those. He'll just be producing them. Mm -hmm. But J.J. Abrams picks pretty good directors. Like, Matt Reeves, who's going to be directing Batman here soon, kind of, like, got his break with J.J. Abrams' Cloverfield movie. Right. But I wouldn't mind seeing J.J. Abrams direct any number of these movies himself. I think he's talented. And that brings us to our question of the week. Which Justice League dark character would you like to see get a solo movie directed by J.J. Abrams, and why? Now, of course, we probably all want to see him direct a actual Justice League dark team film, but this question is in regards specifically to which individual character. Yeah, as a solo film. Post your answer to our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or email us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com. We'll pick our favorite answer and draw that person a Dynamic Duel no prize that we'll post to social media. Moving on from that news, we learned this past week that the directors of the first Captain Marvel film, it was a directing duo, Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck, they will not be directing the Captain Marvel sequel. And instead, it appears they will be tackling another project for the Disney Plus streaming service. It was also announced that Megan McDonnell, who is a staff writer on the upcoming WandaVision television series for Disney+, Plus, will be the writer for the Captain Marvel sequel. I was actually kind of really surprised by this news, considering that Captain Marvel made over a billion dollars. Right, and this is the second upcoming Marvel film that has lost its director, the first being Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. Do you think this is because of creative differences as well? Who knows? It's possible that they may just be looking for a different vision to tackle this particular project, because I think most people will agree that while the first Captain Marvel movie was adequate, it wasn't particularly exciting. It was kind of generic, especially in this day and age in the MCU. It could have been a lot better than what it was. I think we could all agree on that. So yeah, I would love to see a fresh take on this character. According to The Hollywood Reporter, it sounds like Marvel is trying to get a solo female director for this film. And, like, all the rumors surrounding WandaVision is that it's going to be great. Like, it's going to be a really good show. So as long as they get a good director, I think this film should be as successful as the previous one, if not better. I don't know too many female directors off the top of my head that I think would be amazing in this director role. I'm sure there are a ton of them out there. I just don't know their names. Although I did read an article on comicbookmovie.com that mentioned Reed Murano, who recently directed a movie with Jude Law and Blake Lively, an action film. Oh, yeah, the rhythm section. Yes, and it looks fairly decent. If the film was actually good, we don't actually know yet. But I think Reed Morano would be a good choice. There's a lot of different directions the story could take for the Captain Marvel sequel. They could get into the Secret Invasion storyline. They could maybe use it as a way to introduce the A-Force team, like have Carol Danvers train Monica Rambeau, who becomes another Captain Marvel in the comics, and, and characters like Kamala Khan, who's going to get her own show in Ms. Marvel on Disney Plus as well. So it'd be cool if they all kind of like join forces in the sequel. I think that'd be fun. Who knows where they'll take it? and what director they'll choose. But this news does give me higher hopes for Captain Marvel 2 than I had previously. Yeah, yeah, me too. I don't think they have a release date for this film yet. Yeah, it's expected to hit theater sometime in 2022, so they have time. But that does it for all the news for this episode. So let's go ahead and get into our main event, where we pit Batgirl Barbara Gordon against Hawkeye Kate Bishop and find out how much each one would win in a series of 1,000 matches. Let's do it. Okay, Batgirl versus Hawkeye. We've actually done characters also called Batgirl and Hawkeye in previous episodes. Of course, this is specifically the Barbara Gordon Batgirl, not Cassandra Kane, And this is the Kate Bishop Hawkeye, not Clint Barton. Right. Yeah, it gets confusing with these characters both sharing their namesake. As we mentioned earlier, we wanted to do a Batgirl episode leading up to Birds of Prey, considering the fact that she's not in that film and we wanted to do her justice. Yeah, it's a crying shame that she's not in the movie. At least as Oracle, that would have been nice. Yeah, actually, Barbara Gordon as Oracle is probably my favorite take on the character. Really? Yeah. I was kind of disappointed when she became Batgirl again. Because you prefer the Cassandra Kane version of Batgirl? Not necessarily, but I think it was important to have a handicapped superhero character as part of the Bat family who kind of fulfilled the role that she did. Oh, that's valid for that representation. Like, you don't have to be able to walk in order to be a superhero. Exactly. Yeah. Now, why do we choose to put her against Kate Bishop? Well, they both wear purple. (laughs) They both don't have powers. They're both highly skilled and adept in their crime-fighting techniques. 
And with the upcoming Hawkeye television show on Disney Plus next year, I think excitement is starting to build up for her, for people who know who she is, and for people who don't, they may have questions about what she can do. Yeah, I'm looking forward to learn more about her. I don't know actually anything about Kate Bishop, so... If you haven't listened to one of our dual episodes before, the way we determine who wins is statistics. It's all stat based. We compile stats from the official Marvel Power Rankings grid and we extrapolate DC stats from that same criteria. We then take those stats and we plug them into a probabilistic model known as the Monte Carlo simulation that we run a thousand times. Right, and what the Monte Carlo simulation does is it randomizes each stat number along a normal distribution, which is a bell curve. Right. And that represents all the variables that take place in battle. The Monte Carlo simulation is the same approach that the show Deadliest Warrior took when pitting ancient culture races against each other. That was a show that was on Spike TV like over 10 years ago now. But the model is also used in business risk analysis and video game AI. It's known for its reliability in predicting outcomes. Right, and we take this mathematical, scientific approach because math and science are objective. And Joseph and I are both very subjective when it comes to our love of these comic companies and their characters. So there's no subjectivity here. There are no fan votes. No bias. We don't consider outlier feats of these characters from the comics. It's just stats. But before we run these simulations, we go into each character's backstory and abilities. And I believe that it's your turn to go first with the character of Batgirl Barbara Gordon, So let's learn all about her. Okay, so during the Silver Age, Batman and Robin were occasionally joined by Batwoman and her sidekick Batgirl on adventures, but both Kathy and Betty Kane, respectively, were never really more than romantic interests for the dynamic duo. And it wasn't until the introduction of Barbara Gordon in the late 60s, in simultaneously both the comics and Batman television series, that the character really took off in popularity. Hmm. Now, ever since Barbara Gordon was a little girl, she dreamed of being a superhero. She would design costumes and craft superhero identities with her friends in the Ohio suburbs where she was raised by her parents, Roger and Thelma Gordon. Roger had a drinking problem, unfortunately, and Barbara's parents both died in a tragic car accident when she was 13 years old. Her uncle, Jim Gordon, adopted her and brought her to live with him in Gotham City, where he served as captain of the police department. Living in Gotham, Barbara soon became enthralled with the legends of the Batman who protected the city, an obsession that only intensified after one night when she snuck into her adoptive father's home office when she was supposed to be asleep and discovered Jim having a conversation with Batman, who you can learn more about in our Batman vs. Moon Knight episode. Barbara learned about Batman by scouring Gotham's records at the city library. Wanting to be more like her hero, she convinced Jim to put her in martial arts classes, where she quickly gained her black belt. Born with a photographic memory, she excelled in school and graduated from high school early at age 16. As a star athlete, she earned a scholarship to Gotham State University, where she graduated with honors at age 18, earning a degree in library science. As a legal adult, it was her dream to join the police academy and work in law enforcement. But Jim, now the commissioner, forbade her, citing not only the danger in working as a Gotham City police officer, but also the department's height requirement, which Barbara did not meet. How tall is she? (laughs) She's 5'6", so I'm not sure. That seems tall enough. Yeah, it does. It was probably just a policy that Commissioner Gordon enacted to give him another excuse. (laughs) Right. She was also rejected for a field agent position she applied for at the local FBI office. Opportunity struck, however, during an annual Million Dollar Masquerade Ball hosted by the Gotham City Police Department, to which Gotham's richest were invited, including Bruce Wayne. Barbara's costume for the event was a Batman-inspired outfit that she fashioned herself and she arrived late to the ball to find it overtaken by the villain Killer Moth, who was holding Bruce Wayne hostage in front of everyone. Reacting to the situation, Barbara managed to tackle Killer Moth and distract the villain and his henchmen long enough for Bruce Wayne to don his Batman suit and summon his sidekick, Robin. Does Bruce Wayne wear his Batman suit underneath his normal clothes like Superman does? No. So does he have to run back home to the Batcave to get it and then come back to wherever he is? I think he runs to his limousine. Oh, okay. Okay. The dynamic duo returned to the ball and rescued Barbara from Killer Moth, though the villain escaped in the process. Batman chastised Barbara for acting so recklessly and warned her against ever doing anything like that again. 
Discouraged, Barbara returned home, only for Robin to secretly deliver her real batarangs later and reveal to her his secret identity as Dick Grayson, Dang. whom you can learn more about in our Nightwing vs. Daredevil episode. Doing her own detective work, Barbara was able to track down and stop Killer Moth, resulting in Batman reluctantly swearing her in as a member of the Bat family. You have to get sworn into that shit? Yeah, you have to take an oath. Wow. Is it like legally binding? I don't think it is. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a blood oath. Oh, it's just honor system? Yeah, yeah. As time went on, Barbara eventually got her doctorate in information science and technology and a master's degree in law from Harvard. For years, she served as an unassuming librarian during the day and a crime-fighting partner to Batman at night, helping him and Robin take on the worst of Gotham City's rogues gallery. After years of partaking in Gotham's war on crime and having an on-again, off-again romance with Dick Grayson, she decided to retire the Batgirl mantle. Less than one year into Barbara's retirement, however, the Joker showed up at her apartment. The Joker wanted to prove to Batman that anyone, including Commissioner Gordon, could end up crazy like him with just one bad day. The Joker shot Barbara in the gut when she opened the door, severing her spinal cord and paralyzing her from the waist down. Suffering from depression after the incident, it wasn't long before the wheelchair-bound Barbara eventually came to the realization that she could provide a vital service to Batman and the superhero community by using her research and technical skills as an information broker, hacker, and field supervisor under the codename Oracle. She served as the sole source of information to the Bat Family, Suicide Squad, and even the Justice League before she formed her own team with Black Canary that would eventually be known as the Birds of Prey. You can learn more about Black Canary, of course, in our Black Canary vs. Black Widow episode. Barbara served as the Birds of Prey's head of operations from her Clock Tower headquarters, eventually recruiting new members to the team to aid Black Canary, including Huntress, Hawk and Dove, the Question, and more. The team eventually relocated to Metropolis, during which time Barbara became a host to the Superman villain Brainiac, who enabled her to psychically control computer systems by means of a cybernetic virus that also gradually brought back her ability to move her legs. After Brainiac was defeated, however, the hero Dr. Midnight had to remove the virus from Barbara's body and she was once again confined to her wheelchair. Dick Grayson and Barbara became engaged to marry during this time, but they called off their wedding due to the events of the Infinite Crisis storyline. During the final crisis, Barbara was unsuccessful as Oracle in preventing the spread of Darkseid's anti-life equation on the internet, an event you can learn more about in our Darkseid vs Thanos episode. After Darkseid was defeated, Barbara proved victorious in a race against the villainous hacker known as the Calculator in order to collect all of the fragments of the anti-life equation from the Unternet, DC's version of the Dark Web. Okay. After helping Bruce Wayne establish a worldwide network of Batman-inspired crime fighters known as Batman Incorporated, Barbara was kidnapped by her serial killer adoptive brother, James Gordon Jr., whom she stopped with the help of Batman and Commissioner Gordon. In the rebooted New 52 continuity, Barbara Gordon was de-aged along with the rest of DC's superheroes. She was retconned to be the actual daughter of Commissioner Gordon and was Batgirl for only a year as a teenager before she quit. After being paralyzed by the Joker and serving as Oracle for a few years while getting a degree in forensic psychology, a cybernetic implant restored her spinal cord injury and she redonned the mantle of Batgirl. Barbara nevertheless now suffers from PTSD due to the Joker's shooting and she is gun shy in the field, not wanting to become paralyzed once again. Her close friendships with both Black Canary and Huntress on the refounded Birds of Prey team help, however. Whether a member of the Birds of Prey or Batman's Gotham Knights, Barbara is known as the Resourceful One, having a genius level intellect and a didactic or photographic memory, able to recall anything she sees. She's aided by an array of high-tech gadgets and weapons, including a mini-computer, grappling lines, an array of batarangs, a collapsible bow staff, and her personal bat cycle. She's an Olympic-level athlete and an expert in multiple forms of martial arts, including jiu-jitsu, judo, karate, and eskrima, having trained with both Batman, Black Canary, and other world-class fighters. She's a proven team leader and 
while it probably won't come into play in the match, she's a master computer hacker. And that's Batgirl. You know, I realized that I really did not know anything about Batgirl's history. Like, I knew the character. I knew she was always part of the Bat family and everything. And I knew that she was Commissioner Gordon's daughter. But I never really learned how she came to be Batgirl. So that was interesting. Yeah, I think she has a fascinating backstory. She's one of the most interesting and inspiring characters in DC. The way, you know, she overcame victimhood and was still able to be a superhero. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Based on her abilities, this is going to be a really good matchup against Hawkeye, Kate Bishop. Let me go ahead and get into her backstory. Now, Kate Bishop grew up in a wealthy Manhattanite family, daughter of Derek Bishop, a publishing magnate, and his estranged wife, Eleanor, who died while Kate was young. One night as a child, she witnessed her father beat someone up in his office, and she began secretly investigating him. This led her to the criminal known as the Matador, who found her out and kidnapped her, holding her for ransom. Kate managed to break free, but just as she was about to be captured again while escaping, she saw an arrow fly by her and hit the guy chasing her. The Avengers had burst onto the scene, as Hawkeye had been keeping tabs on the Matador. Kate was amazed by all of the Avengers, but particularly Hawkeye, who was a superhero without superpowers, who got to stand shoulder to shoulder with powerhouses based on just his incredible skill alone. She grew up idolizing the hero, wanting to help others. Kate grew up independent and largely a loner, disconnected from her father and sister and their general apathy toward charity and self-sacrifice. Uncomfortable with her family's wealth, she spent a lot of time volunteering at soup kitchens and women's shelters. One evening, while walking through Central Park, Kate was attacked and assaulted. Traumatized by the incident, Kate attended therapy and resolved to dedicate herself to a vigorous training regimen in self-defense, fencing, and of course, archery, to help prevent herself and others from other possible attacks. During her sister's wedding, Kate and 200 other guests were held hostage by gunmen in St. Patrick's Cathedral. The newly formed Young Avengers team, consisting of Patriot, Hulkling, Wiccan, and Iron Lad, tried to save the attendees, but ended up accidentally starting a fire and letting Kate get captured due to their relative inexperience as heroes. However, Kate managed to help save everyone using one of Patriot's throwing stars to create a diversion and helped fight off the gunman. After the incident, she befriended the daughter of Ant-Man, Cassie Lang, and the two sought out the Young Avengers. They found them using the old Avengers mansion as a base and joined the team. They were immediately attacked by Kang the Conqueror, and Kate used old Avengers gear, including Swordsman's Sword, Mockingbird's Battle Staves, and Hawkeye's Bow to fight back. The Young Avengers were ordered to disband by Captain America and Iron Man, and had their gear and uniforms taken away. However, using her dad's funds, Kate became the financial backer of the team and bought the Young Avengers new uniforms and gear, as well as securing an empty building owned by her father as a base. After a fight alongside the Avengers against a Kree and Skrull alien invasion, Captain America and Jessica Jones gave Hawkeye's old bow back to Kate, as well as a blessing to use his codename as the hero because at the time, Clint Barton was assumed dead due to the Scarlet Witch's loss of control of her powers because of the manipulations of Doctor Doom, which you can learn more about in our Zatanna vs. Scarlet Witch episode. During the Civil War event, Kate and the Young Avengers sided with Captain America against the Superhuman Registration Act. After that ended and Captain America was assassinated, Kate met the newly resurrected Clint Barton for the first time when he was dressed as Captain America as he had briefly considered taking up Cap's mantle. Huh. Their encounter convinced Clint not to become the new Captain America, and he took on a more ninja-like identity of Ronin instead. Ah. You can learn more about this in our Green Arrow vs. Hawkeye episode. Clint ended up bestowing a blessing of his own on Kate by letting her share his codename and keep his bow despite beating her in an archery contest. He did, however, offer to train her even further. Kate continued adventuring with the Young Avengers alongside the Runaways against the Secret Scroll invasion. With the team, she also fought the Dark Young Avengers and Doctor Doom, after which the team disbanded, though they were soon after declared as honorary Avengers for their acts of heroism. Oh. Kate delved into her training with Clint, and the two went on several adventures as a duo, with Clint often getting them involved in dangerous situations and Kate proving herself beyond capable of keeping up, such as when she saved Clint's life and reputation by capturing and impersonating the supervillainess Madame Mask single-handedly. 
She eventually rejoined the reformed Young Avengers and briefly used a Kree energy bow during their heroic exploits through space and the multiverse alongside Novar aka Marvel Boy and America Chavez aka Miss America. When Kate returned to Earth, she learned that her father had cut her off financially. She moved to Los Angeles for a short time where she took on work as a private investigator and hero for hire, primarily getting entangled in a vengeance plot by Madame Mask, who was illegally using life model decoy android technology to increase the lifespans of the super rich. Kate discovered that her father Derek was actually one of Madame Mask's clients and that her mother Eleanor was still alive after all these years and actually working for Madame Mask. It turned out that Eleanor was actually murdered by Derek, but she was resurrected as a vampire to exact her revenge on her husband and was using Madame Mask's resources to acquire a vampire cure. What? Yeah, that was weird. While in Los Angeles, Kate consulted with Clint Barton on the formation of a new West Coast Avengers team after recognizing the city's need for superhero protection. Clint encouraged her to start and lead the group and even agreed to part-time membership to help get it going. Kate recruited Fuse, Ms. America, Gwenpool, and Quentin Quire, and the team put a stop to Madame Mask's West Coast Masters of Evil. Powers-wise, Kate has none to speak of, but like Clint Barton, she is exceptionally skilled. She is an adept fighter with proficiency in boxing, jiu-jitsu, and fencing. She carries battle staves similar to Mockingbirds, a sword, and of course, a bow, with which she's an expert marksman. In her quiver are any number of a variety of trick arrows, including, but not limited to, standard arrows, sonic arrows, explosive arrows, tear gas arrows, acid arrows, cable arrows, putty arrows, bola arrows, taser arrows, net arrows, boomerang arrows, and tranquilizer arrows. Oh, bad girl has all of those batterings. No, she doesn't. I'm pretty sure she has most of them. <laughs> all right, but yeah, that's uh, that's Kate Bishop for you. I actually saw a lot of similarities between her backstory and Batgirl's, Barbara Gordon's. Yeah, I think this is a pretty good matchup. Not just power set-wise, but also, you know, character-wise. Yeah. All right, so now that we've gone into the backstories of each character, what Jonathan and I like to do now is improvise a scenario speculating on how we think one of the 1,000 simulations that we run would actually play out beat for beat. We don't set any rules for this scenario other than the fact that the characters don't know anything about each other going into it. They're meeting each other for the first time. The only thing they do know is that the other character is a threat that they need to put down. Right. The characters start off about 50 yards apart. These characters have to win on their own merits without environmental help because some characters fare better in certain environments over others. And we don't take stats for the environment. So let's go ahead and get into it. Barbara Gordon versus Kate Bishop. Who goes first? I'm going to say that Kate Bishop goes first just because I think she has better long range equipment to do so. Yeah, that's fair. With her bow. So she's going to pull out her bow. And right when she does, Batgirl throws down a smoke pellet. So now Kate Bishop can't even see where she's shooting. That's fine. You know why? Because Kate sees the smoke and the first arrow that she knocks is a tear gas arrow. So Batgirl thinks that she's hidden within this smoke cloud, but then she starts coughing because now it's a tear gas cloud. Okay, but the tear gas, in addition to her smoke pellet, provides ample coverage for her to stealthily sneak around the environment. She puts on a gas mask, so the tear gas doesn't actually affect her. Oh, she has one of those? Yes. Oh, uh, damn. Okay, so Batgirl stealthily maneuvers behind Hawkeye and just, like, does a leg sweep, following up with an extension of her bow staff, and she just starts attacking Kate Bishop on the ground with her staff. Kate Bishop is flat on her back. Well, while on her back, Kate Bishop uses her bow to block and parry Batgirl's bow staff attacks, fighting her way off her back to a kneeling position, still blocking, and then a standing position. And she jumps up in the air and delivers a jump sidekick to the side of Barbara Gordon's head. But Barbara's a way better martial artist. I mean, and if you say so. She's going to prove it by, like, using her bow staff as, like, a pole vault to deliver a pretty hard double kick to Kate Bishop's torso, just, like, sending her flying back. Okay, so Kate goes flying backwards, probably lands on her ass. And Batgirl follows up by throwing like a little sonic screamer disc that lands right at Kate Bishop's feet. But right as it goes off, Kate reacts by doing back handsprings away from the sonic disc, and mid-air, she shoots an arrow into the disc, cutting the frequency. When Kate lands, Kate immediately fires a tranquilizer arrow that hits Batgirl right in the neck and puts her right to sleep. 
Well, little did you know that Batgirl's utility belt has a bunch of serums in it. Uh-huh. So she pulls out like an adrenaline shot and just, just like Pulp Fiction's herself. <laughs> to avoid being knocked out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now she's like super jacked on adrenaline. Okay. And she just like lets loose a volley of like three electric batarangs towards Kate Bishop. And Kate shoots all three of them out of the air with her bow and arrow. She can hit up to five targets at one time. And without missing a beat, she fires another arrow straight at Batgirl's face. Luckily, with all these arrow shots, Batgirl ducked in time, you know, because she's also hyper aware on the adrenaline, and she uses a net launcher to fire a net at Kate Bishop, trapping her. Okay, so Kate is trapped in a net, but she pulls out her swordsman sword and just cuts through the net and then crawls out. Okay, but by the time she does that, Batgirl has closed the distance between them Uh huh. and knocks Kate's sword away with her bow staff to disarm her. She then uses a grappling hook to pull the sword towards her. Now she has the sword. Okay, but little did you know, the arrow that Batgirl ducked out of the way of earlier was actually a boomerang arrow. And by this time, oh, it's made its return trip. And as Batgirl's holding the sword, she gets knocked in the back of the head by the blunt force of the boomerang arrow. Ah, oh, good move. So she drops the sword, and like a badass, Kate slides over, picks up the sword, swings it at Batgirl. Batgirl probably ducks the swing, but in the process, gets her cape chopped off. Okay, but to prevent future sword attacks against her, Batgirl's gonna throw down a flashbang and it's gonna blind Hawkeye. Oh, that's really not good. (laughs) Okay, so Kate like winces and she blinks heavily, not really able to make anything out because all she sees are spots now really from the flashbang. So while Hawkeye is stunned, Batgirl jumps in and kicks her sword out of her hand. It follows up with an uppercut straight to Kate Bishop's jaw. So now Kate is seeing stars in more ways than one. Yeah, Kate is definitely feeling it right now. She's probably knocked back, but she's resilient. She can't see anything, but what she's going to do is she's just going to grab five random arrows out of her quiver. She doesn't even know what she's firing at this time. What? But she fires them all in a volley in Batgirl's general direction. And a few of them hit. The ones that do hit are the putty arrow, which adheres one of Batgirl's feet to the ground. Uh Uh-huh. And an explosive arrow, which doesn't hit her directly, but explodes within Batgirl's vicinity to provide enough concussive force to just knock her out. Okay, Uh, but that force is also going to knock the other three arrows off their target, so it doesn't even matter what those ones were. No, well, I mean, Kate couldn't see where she was firing that well anyway. That probably would have, like, broken her ankle, the way she was, like, knocked over to the ground with it still, like, adhered to the floor. Yeah, it did break her ankle. Her ankle's broken now. Okay, but, I mean, Barbara has been, like confined to a wheelchair before. You know, this is not like a new situation. She's still very much capable, even when her legs don't work. So as she's on the ground, she pulls out her like little mini computer and calls in like a drone missile strike from like a Wayne Tech satellite on Kate Bishop. Damn. But I say that before this drone strike even hits Kate, she knocks another arrow and just shoots it right into Batgirl's spine, severing it once what? again. And that flashbang effect has already worn off by this point because, you know, Kate wears sunglasses all the time. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't nearly as strong as it probably could have been. This match is over. Okay, well, Batgirl may be paralyzed, but Kate Bishop is still dead from the drone strike. Well, I say that this particular arrow paralyzed her from the waist up. (laughs) What? So she's dead. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. I guess they both are then. (laughs) Yep. It's probably a good place to leave the match. All right, yep. Let's go ahead and run the simulations on this match and find out which of these characters would actually come out on top. I love both of these characters. They're just so awesome. And they're pretty comparable in a lot of the stats. I mean, they have the same movement speed. They have the same strength, the same damage potential with their explosive weapons. Yeah, although we did say that Barbara Gordon is a slightly better fighter. She's slightly smarter. And we said slightly more durable, considering that Kate's outfit is basically spandex. Her thighs and her shoulders are both exposed. Right, Batgirl's suit offers her more protection. But Kate makes up for a lot of this with the range of her abilities. She can attack a lot easier from a greater distance than Batgirl can, because most of her ranged weapons are thrown. So we put up a poll earlier this week on Instagram, asking you, the listeners, who you thought would win in this match. Right, and it looks like 76% of our Instagram followers think that Batgirl will actually be victorious in this match. But what the hell do they know, right? This one is obviously Kate Bishop's. I mean, there's a lot of Batgirl fans out there, so I'm not surprised by by those results. But you seem pretty confident that Kate Bishop is going to win. Oh, I am. I'm very confident. Well, I have the results here, and I can tell you that you are incorrect. 
Batgirl no. wins no. 59.1% of the time. No, you're wrong. <laughs> Kate Bishop only won 409 of the 1,000 battles, or 40.9% of the time. This was definitely not a coin toss. Barbara Gordon definitely beats Kate Bishop. Kate, Kate wins this one. Nope. <laughs> nope. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> How did Kate lose this one? She has so many tricks up her sleeve, although I guess every single member of the Bat family also has those type of tricks. Well, the only thing she had up on Batgirl was range. In every other category, they were either equal or Batgirl was slightly ahead. So when you said that she made up for it with her range, I was like, I don't know about that. Well, in my heart, Kate still wins. So in the end, that's all that really matters, right? Nope. It's the math that matters. I always hated math. That wraps up this match. Let us know what you thought of it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or you can reach out to us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com. Right, and don't forget to visit us on dynamicduel.com where you can actually listen to this podcast, learn more about Jonathan and myself, see statistics on the show, a whole bunch of cool stuff, even get access to our Patreon page and our Tee Public page, where we sell lots of cool merchandise using Jonathan's No Prize artwork. Now, who are you drawing for this week's episode, Jonathan? I think I'm doing Kate Bishop this week, and next week I'll be drawing Batgirl, because in our next episode, we will be reviewing Batman The Killing Joke, an animated film that came out two years ago. Right, and Batgirl played a large role in that story. It's the story where she gets paralyzed by the Joker. Right. I haven't seen it before, so I'm looking forward to watching it this next week. And I think it'll be a good lead in to the Birds of Prey review that we do the following week. Yeah, we got some good episodes coming up for you guys. Don't forget to share our show, subscribe to it, rate it, and review us if you can. We would totally appreciate it. Special thanks to our executive producers, John Spees and Bodo Winter. And that does it for this episode. Up, up, and away. True believers.